I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite podcast on the Citadel. Welcome to Andromeda Nerds, the number one Mass Effect podcast on the internet. In the world. My name is Minius of Minius GC, and with me are my co-hosts, Tucker from Mass Effect Follower. Hello everyone, I did survive the hurricane. Woo! And the one and only <laughs> Biofan. How's it going? I still have a little bit of mucus, so I apologize for that. Still? Yeah, I'm still a little bit. I got the plague, okay? I got the friggin' well, plague. Well, you're exaggerating, right? Because you totally beat. Yeah, I don't shit. have the literal plague, Minius. I just have an <laughs> upper respiratory infection. <laughs> hey, uh, this is episode number ten. Hey! Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> oh. Double digits! <laughs> well, fire fireworks just went off where I live. Woo! See, oh, they were yeah. they know it. It's episode they know number it. ten. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. add some sound effects right here. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, so Andromeda Nerds post every week, Thursdays at noon Pacific, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, and 8 at night in the UK. If you'd like to contribute to the show with a question or topic suggestion, email us at andromenerds at gmail.com. And we're going to start the show a little bit backwards. Our main topic is going to be science, which we'll get to later, because there's a little new, little news thingies. First of all, Biofan, you have a theory that so, you're super eager about. It theory, better not be about blue butts again, because I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you. No, it doesn't directly have anything <laughs> to do with blue butts. <laughs> Indirectly, sure. <laughs> Directly, no. So, um, a commenter on one of my videos uh, suggested that I go look at Morinth's voice actress and then compare that to the voice of the Asari in the new gameplay footage, in her voice, and it actually sounds like scary similar. Like, Morinth's voice, and this is the new Asari's voice. I'll send you guys a link to Morinth talking. It sounds like crazy similar. Like, yeah, I've, crazy I've checked that similar. out. Uh, crazy it does similar. sound very similar. That'd be a little weird, because they've already she's already voiced an Asari. But she didn't have a lot of lines, though. So. Even... Yeah, but you could bring her along. I guess I never really did blink bring her along, so I don't know how many more lines she and has. And like, if, if you do bring her along when she's out in the field with you, she impersonates her mom, so it's not her lines, really. Hmm. Maybe I, sh- I don't... I, I gotta replay these things way too many times. But yeah, that's one thing, just to look at. Because I thought it sounded a lot like Courtney Taylor, who voiced Jack, and it still does, kind of. But Natalia Sigluti, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, sounds... It's- I don't think she says it that slowly. What? That would... Yeah. I don't, I don't think she says it that okay, slowly. Okay, well, you know what? <laughs> but I think it sounds South a lot American like American Italian. Her. Yeah. It so- it, uh, the voice sounds really similar. And then... A little kind of biology anecdote from my real life. I had like an anatomy and physiology test this week. And one of the questions I know only because I've played Mass Effect. And that is, so on your oxcoxa, which is like your hip bone, you have these kind of wing-like structures that are called the ilium. So I was like, well, that's a planet from Mass Effect. Boom. Instant no. And I got that on the test. Okay, I'm glad you didn't. They didn't say like is faster than light travel possible. And you're like, yes, you just need some ezo because <laughs> you're not gonna get that right. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, but I got ilium right. I was like, it's your hip wing thing. Boom. Okay. Anyway, a little. These are little tiny notes. Uh, there was a leak, sort of, of a pop toy list that's coming out, and I believe it was January. There were a couple Mass Effect Andromeda items coming out, and one of the names that was on that was Sarah, and we have a bunch of different ideas about that. First of all, if you want to pronounce it Sarah, you're probably right, but in North America, we pronounce it Sarah, and the game's being made in North America, so if it is just Sarah, then it may be pronounced Sarah, which is a little weird. If it is Sarah, that's a bit different than Sarah from Dragon Age Inquisition. It might not even be a real name, and also, what, what yeah, did you I, spot? 
I think it is kind of... No, uh, actually, you go first. before we get into that, there is one pop coming out in January and another coming out in February. So they're not both coming out in January. Okay. Yes, you are correct. The it Sarah is, one in January. It is kind of weird, though, if they do you go with the name Sarah, because they have Sarah in Dragon Age Inquisition. So I don't... if. Unless Sarah is the name of the default name of female writer, which you can change, by the way. People that were all complaining in my video when I revealed that, they were all like, eh, I want to pick my own name. Like, you will get to. But um, unless it's the protagonist, I don't see that getting through the editing team at all because they had Sarah for Dragon's Inquisition. But if it's the protagonist's name, I guess I could see that since oh. she's so much more important. Sarah is also a very common name, so it's like if if you use it in one thing, that does not mean you can never use that ever again it, in anything. It doesn't, but at the same time, for the very next product they put out, I think the editing team would be like, "Hell no, you can't use that." They've done less. Don't use like, Sarah. They, use Stephanie. <laughs> they've they've changed character names for for less. Like for example, for Dragon Age Inquisition, Vivian was not originally Vivian. I think it was like it was Hilda. And if you Google image Hilda, it's like this semi-erotic, busty woman from Europe that's used in different kind of like art things. So they were like, oh, we don't want her associated with that. We have to change her name. So they've changed names oh, for yes, less. Because we definitely, because uh, a Bioware game, we definitely don't want anything sexual <laughs> to ever accidentally come I'm up. I'm just saying. Uh, sorry. They have changed character names for less. So, what about Morden Solus and then Solus? Apparently, that is just happenstance. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually something I get confused a lot about. Whenever people talk about Solus, I'm like, when I Morden? When I interviewed Patrick Weeks, that was one of the questions I asked him, and he said it was just happenstance. Like, when they named when they named Morden Solus, and it's also spelled differently, by the way. They When they named Morden Solus, I think they already had the idea of naming Solus in Dragon Age Inquisition. I looked up uh, the pictures of Hilda, and they look like rejected Playboy pinups from the 1950s. Yep, there you go. <laughs> so the other thing about I've been the... playing a lot of Mafia Three, so <laughs> those are. I, I want to touch on one real quick thing about the name. You mentioned mm -hmm. that names for the protagonists have always been changeable. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll be able to change both the brother and sister's name I since think, there's a pair well, of siblings? I think because obviously. You aren't going to call your sibling like, oh, fellow writer member family thing. Like, you're going to yeah. call them by your first name. So that's probably like if you choose female writer, you'll call your then brother Scott. Then the male Scott. writer would be Scott. And, and then the other you would way call around your be... female. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll make voice, like setting up all the voice acting stuff. They'll make it a lot easier. Yeah. I'm wondering, though, if that'll anger people. If you can name your own character, but your sibling has a set name. Let us know if that's going to well, annoy you. Well, you know, if you're picking one character, then too bad. It's the other character is set up as it is. Unless they pull a Fallout 4 kind of thing where you can customize the way they both look, but still, you can't... Can you change the other person's name? I think you can, but they end up no, calling you, you like he or she. You can't change yeah, their name. Yeah, and they name. also die within like fi the first 15 minutes of the you game. You'll still later in the game refer to them... Like, you refer to the wife as Nora later in the game, so you don't change their name. But in oh, that's true. Mass Effect, you w in Andromeda, you can change your protagonist's name. I don't know if you can change your siblings. In Dragon Age 2, when you have the Hawk family, they get away with calling you brother or sister the whole time. But I don't think... I don't know. That seems like it fits more for Dragon Age setting, but for a Mass Effect, more modern day kind of story, it'd be kind of weird. You know? And also in the trilogy, everyone calls you Shepard. They never call you John or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, because they can't um, voice inputs to where any yeah. name you type in can be said. The technology is not quite there yet. You're writer or you're a pathfinder, but I don't think your sibling would... But your sibling will... I don't know what your sibling would call you. Probably like brother or sister, but you call them like Sarah or Scott. Could be a nickname thing. No, it's not just that. It's also, uh, this is something that one of the writers at Mass Effect Follower pointed out. Um, it could, the name could be also cut off. Because yeah. if you look through the list, there are Which other writer? names Give the person that are credit. cut off. What? Which writer? Give the person credit. Uh, Dan, who is one of the writers at Mass Effect Follower. Shout out to Dan. He pointed out, yeah, he pointed out that um, the names are cut off. 
that some of them are cut off at a certain point. So it could be Sarah. It could be Sarah Della Lapitis. <laughs> of course, like if you you can probably put Sarah into a three syllable Asari name because we don't have a name for the Asari confirmed yeah. yet. Or also, it could be, and I mean, the, and also a pop version of the raccoon Asari would be that'd be adorable. Yeah, I would totally buy that. Totally It'd be a little that. bit weird if her name was Sara and she's not Liara. I think that wouldn't work. Sara Liara. Yeah, there's that. Um, but also maybe if the Asari is Sarah, she has a human father, male or female father, that would name her a human name. That would also work. I, I also another. Digressing back to a shout out to Dan. He's the one that writes all the lore videos on uh, Mass Effect Follower. Double shout out to Dan. So he's been kicking ass with those. Although he we wrote rewrote those. Well, he wrote those a while ago. I wrote the Elcor one, but he wrote those a while ago. Um, yeah, they're still pretty good. So I uh, he's he's a writer. <laughs> he is the writer. Uh, and Elwin. Or they're both the writers at Mass Effect Follow. I want some writers. Both of them are fantastic. I can't afford anybody. Yeah, I can't. Good either. for you, dude. You might make us all jealous. That's and the stuff. difference between. <laughs> that's the difference. Well, I see, make it go so much faster. No, no wonder you get videos out all, all the time. You don't have to write your own. I got two writers, and I got another video editor. So, uh, one more little thing that I wanted to point out, and I don't know if this actually means anything. There are two major. EA games coming out this month. One is coming out tomorrow, if you're listening to this. And the other one's coming out next week. And that's weird because they're both on a Friday, October 31st. What? That's really And weird. October 28th. But, m- what comes out on the 31st? Is one of them a horror game, though? I could see Halloween being, like, a thing, but I don't know why. Battlefield 1 is coming out on the 21st, and this is in oh, North America. Oh, I thought America. it was the 31st. Hmm. So... Normally, I mean, the games in in the UK and Europe come out on Fridays all the time. Well, are they making it a global release then? And that's why they pushed them back to Fridays? I don't know. In the case of Battlefield 1, they're doing super money thing where you can buy early access and play play it on a Tuesday. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to go to Amazon UK and find out. But then also Titanfall 2 comes out the next Friday on a Friday. And there is no early access to that. Oh, there isn't. They typically no, there is they not. Typically love doing that. I do not know that. I, Although, I I imagine that the early release and they also did it with Battlefront. Oh, Minius. By the way, you got the date wrong. The twenty eighth is the Friday, not the thirty first. I said twenty eighth. Oh, you did. Okay. Well, it, then they then they must be doing a global release for Titanfall two and that other one, because in the UK it's also the twenty eighth for the release date. So I'm guessing it's a global release kind of deal, maybe. A reason why they could be doing the early access for like Battlefield One, the same reason why they did it for Battlefront, is you know Battlefield. Even though the campaign looks amazing, that's not the main focus for a lot of fans. It's the multiplayer. So you know if they put the campaign out or if there's spoilers, people don't care as much. While Titanfall Two is the first one where they're having a campaign, and they're probably and. I mean, not probably. They put a lot of effort into the campaign, and they probably don't want it spoiled for the masses. There's also the possibility that since Battlefield 1 is coming out on a Friday, they want to give that as much room as possible. So they're pushing that to a Friday. But Well, they typically... I mean, they typically do Tuesday releases, so if there's any issues with the game, they can get it fixed before the weekend. Anyway, we've gotten a little bit sideways. The reason- they can get, like, servers all good and everything the reason i'm bringing this up is because these are ea games and mass effect is an ea game so that opens up the possibility of a friday release maybe and uh, i don't know yeah that <laughs> i i would agree with you if we are at the point where we're, we're thinking it's the 21st yeah because of the book I'm thing very confident about the 21st because the art book and for those that didn't listen to the last episode or haven't seen our videos recently they so the art book for Mass Effect Andromeda is confirmed to come out on the 21st of March, and Amazon also said it would come out simultaneously, depending on how much you respect Amazon as a source. But also look at Dragon Age Inquisition. Its art book came out the same day as the game as well. So March 21st is very, very likely the release date for Mass Effect Andromeda, which is on a Tuesday. Here's why it's important, though, and this is the only reason why it's important. The Crown. <laughs> if it bumps up a Friday, if it bumps up one Friday, you get the crown outright. If it bumps back one Friday, I get the crown outright. Okay. Very important. 
If it hits the 21st, I'm sitting we both in get here with crown. my February release if, date. If it gets bumped up by a month, Tucker gets the crown. <laughs> Dude, I'm sitting here with my February release date still. You know, hey, it could be. You never know. All right, so uh, today, as people are listening to this, it's Thursday. Guess what I'm doing in a couple hours? What are you doing? I'm going to play the crap out of Civ Six. Nice. Going to play the crap out of it, which is how I noticed the Friday release t- date thing, because that is on a Friday, which is weird. But I figured that a lot of people know we like Mass Effect. I mean, some of you guys have backgrounds in other games. Biofan, obviously, Bioware games are your thing. Tucker has a huge Halo background, but you guys don't know what kind of games we like other than just Mass Effect. So I thought, hey, let's talk about what kind of games we like and maybe... Come up with some suggestions for you for games you can play while we wait for Mass Effect Andromeda, which still is many months out. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of time. It is a lot of time. You have time to play some games. (laughs) You do. You have like especially some of the games I have uh, suggestions for that are like two hour games that are extremely worth it. Well, what kind of uh, what kind of games do you guys normally like? I mean, let's start with with Biofan because I I somehow I think he's the easiest. I have a collection in my hand. Um, okay, so you like games like Dragon Age, right? Do you like Dragon Age? Oh, no, I hate Dragon Age. No, is that, I love okay. Dragon Age so much. Dragon Age, like, I love Mass Effect, don't get me wrong, but Dragon Age is, like, my baby. Like, I love Dragon Age. It was the first Bioware game I ever played. I love Dragon Age. Um, I also really like Pokemon games, like the ones that come out for, like, the DS, so, like, the different versions um, I occasionally will pick up an Assassin's Creed. The last few have really disappointed me. Syndicate was really good, though. I enjoyed that. Um, I also liked Fallout 4. Um, I play around Soul Calibur games occasionally, mostly for, the, like... The, really? Yeah, I, mostly for, like, that part of the game where you can kind of create a character. I loved doing yeah, that. Okay. Um, like, I made, like, concepts for my Inquisitors back before Inquisition released in that, because it had really good like kind of like create a character and make your character customize outfits, change colors and whatnot. Um, I recently just finished replaying one of my favorite old RPGs of all time, which was Enchanted Arms that came out in like 2006 for the Xbox 360. Love that game so much. I think it's on PS3 as well. Love Enchanted Arms. It's really good. I also really like Sims games. I kind of create my own little stories and things through that. I like the Sims stuff though the game that i would suggest playing while you're waiting for mass effect andromeda is because it's made by some former bioware developers it's an indie game called the banner saga and there's two games so far it's going to be a trilogy possibly more after that but at first it's going to be a trilogy and there's two so far banner saga and banner saga 2 and it's about um like vikings and there's this thing that goes on that's similar to kind of like the blight, but it's a little more complicated um, in terms of morality. And it's really good because you make all these choices and people die. And there's also this kind of like asset management to the choices as well, because you have food and resources and things and people to feed and things like that. And it's actually you- what, what, what were you going to say? I, I have Banna Saga 2 because mm-hmm. that was one of the free games with gold. Yeah. Uh, do you have to play the first one, or is it like two different stories set in the same area, like Dragon It's Age? a direct continuation, but if okay. you play the first one, you can go into the second one with all of your resources and stuff. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll grab the first one. And some then. of the, and you'll meet a lot of the characters that are in the second one that are in the first one, and there's a, there's a lot of context in terms of the world in the first one. So I really suggest playing the first one and then the second one. I think they're only like twenty bucks if you don't get them yeah, free on gold. They're, so they're, they're really cheap not that expensive. And they're available. They're available everywhere, pretty much. And I think they're like fifteen to twenty hours each. So they're not huge, but pretty, pretty, pretty good. The second one's better, but the first one you got to play. Somewhat topical question: Have you played Knights of the Old Republic? I have it. I, I oh want no. To play it. I oh, have no! not played it yet. I have. I have no! It. I played the like beginning area for the stormtroopers about four times, but every time I play it, I get reminded of RuinScape, and I go and start playing the old 2007 old school RuinScape servers that are up. 
Okay, if you're a, if you're a Mass Effect fan <laughs> and you're listening to this and you don't have a game to play, I would recommend Knights of the Old Republic because that is pretty much the proto Mass Effect, straight up proto Mass Effect. Okay, I should definitely get onto that because I have it. Like I, I intend to play it. I just have it sitting yeah. in a drawer at the moment. Written by Drew Carpishan, directed by Casey Hudson. It's got Jennifer Hale in it. It's got Ooh. Raphael Sparge in it. Ooh, it's. It's 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 a legitimate proto Mass Effect, and you can who, see the bones who, everywhere. Can you romance Raphael Sabarge's character? That's my main question. Oh man, I don't remember that. Because he voices I... Caden, and if there is Caden in Star Wars, I will be right there right now. I don't think I played it multiple times, and I remember romancing Jennifer Hale's character. Although I don't remember romance being a big okay. Well, I will find deal in out. It, but but then again. I played the last time I played it all the way through was a while ago. I played it partially and it kind of holds up and you mm-hmm. can get it everywhere now and it's not very expensive. So that would be one of the games I'd recommend. Bioware right. game by the way. I will I will Bio get fan. on that cuz it's I I've needed to play it. So I will play That's it. That's surprising. <laughs> okay, uh Tucker, do you want to talk about games for a while cuz we like video games here on Andromeda Nerds? Oh, I mean an issue with that is I play almost every single video game. Thanks to that's horrible having a lot of friends that all play video games and uh, sharing the games like that, and from full sale getting games there and just all all that stuff. I, I don't see how that's an uh, issue, but go ahead. Well, I mean, like when it comes to oh, recommend video games. A lot of my stuff is just recent games I've been enjoying. That works. But my all-time favorite game mm. is Portal Two. Classic. So, Portal 2, love the humor, love the puzzle, everything like that. But some recent games that I would really recommend that are just absolutely fantastic, and they both tell a f- absolutely amazing story without a single dialogue, is Unravel and Inside. Hmm. Both of them tell a story without a single line of dialogue. I like how Unravel does that. It was beautiful. But at the same time, I was looking for a relaxing experience, and I suck at Unravel. So after like 20 minutes, I was like, this is stressful. This is not what I wanted. And like, put it down. Well, Unravel is where you play as uh, Yarny. And, you know, you're solving... Well, basically, this old woman makes you, and she's not there. And Yarny goes through her memories... Like, a, me- a book, a memory book, goes through and plays the memories trying to find her. So, the very first few levels, you see her as a kid, and then as they grow up, as she's a teenager, and then she finds who is the grandparents, uh, or who's the grandfather, and so, you know, you see them dating and going through, you see her life story, and it's amazing. The, the way it tells the story, and the music is beautiful, and uh, my girlfriend actually made me a uh, Yarny. She uh, made one for me, which that's, that's one of my one of my favorite, probably one of my favorite things. But um, if you're a fan of Mass one, Effect, though, how how Mass Effect are these games? Because they didn't. Oh, absolutely. Well, they're not related to Mass Effect at all. It's just that they were fantastic stories. Oh, how, so you'd recommend them based on stories if you're a fan of Mass Effect? Yeah. Well, I mean, Mass Effect is a fantastic story, and this one is very, obviously, very story-based. And, well, the other one is Inside, which is made by the same people that made Limbo. And it is a weird dystopian future or kind of game where you play as a kid who breaks into a building where there's, like, slave kind of people, but they're, like, mind-controlled slaves, and you solve puzzles. And it's really weird, and I can't explain it without spoiling it okay so but it's made by the people that made limbo so if you enjoyed limbo you would enjoy inside and they're both like 15 dollars, and they're about two to three hours to complete all right name a couple genres in general game you want the one interesting thing i found about mass effect is it appeals to so many different people for so many different reasons so that's why i wanted to bring this up what other kinds of games do you normally gravitate to I'm pr- there is not a specific one. I'm, I just don't just do. play sports games. Yeah. Not sports I mean, games. Literally, literally, the list of games that I've recently played are is Mafia 3, Gears of War 4, South Park Stick of Truth, Unravel, and uh, well, 
Halo, but I'm not counting that. It's I just play any game that I'm in the mood for, or any game I haven't gotten all the achievements for, because I, I do that. I like achievements. How about some of the games that you've put the most hours to in the last 10 years, other than... I was Master Chief Collection. Okay. Halo, easy. I've put over 700 hours into that game. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, if I look at it, it's it's like 700, 800 hours into that one game. Yeah, when they start counting that high, I like to pretend that that number doesn't exist. Because I feel bad for the rest of my life. Either that or RuneScape, but does that really count? Because I've put like years of my life into RuneScape. Totally counts. Totally counts. All right, yeah, RuneScape. I think for me, the game I've spent the most time in would be Dragon Age Inquisition. Probably about 700 what? hours. Yeah. What? You spend time playing Dragon Age Inquisition? <laughs> I have 13 Inquisitors, okay? How long were you in the Hinterlands? Like, five hours? Ha, that's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to say that. Like, my first playthrough, maybe like 10. But then after that, I was like, I... Meh. I like go. I've, I've learned. I've gotten Stockholm syndrome after like the, <laughs> the hinterlands. <laughs> after the first like, I guess three playthroughs, I figured out which quests to do to get the maximum amount of power points fastest to like progress through the story faster. So yeah, that makes sense. That's why I don't stay in the hinterlands like too too long. Yeah. All right. So I have a number of different games that I like. Uh, obviously. The number one genre of game that I like is action RPG. Uh, really love those. And if you like action RPGs, and you probably do, because you are listening to a Mass Effect podcast, uh, this suggestion is ridiculously obvious, but I you need to play The Witcher 3. Okay, I played oh, it, yeah, that's... and I got bored after an hour, and I haven't played it since. Now, there's that's the it. thing about The Witcher 3 where it's different from Mass Effect games and Bioware games in general is that you play a specific character and you play, you know, a straight white male and that's it. So that doesn't appeal to everybody, but it's a phenomenal step forward in the very specific Mass Effect type game where it's conversational and branching choices and the way they do the open world oh, and the combat. Dude, oh, branching choices, branching choices. You got the Telltale games. Oh, yeah, those. Like I, how you I've, cut uh, me off to talk about Telltale games, man. <laughs> Witcher 3 drops those Dude, Telltale yeah, games no, on your like, face. Like, The Walking Dead is amazing. Um, the Batman one I've heard is fantastic. There is The Wolf Among Us. I did the Game of Thrones one. It was, pre- it was interesting. Yeah, you know, that's one that exists. I mean, they're all... The, it's, it, the Telltale games are... Especially because if you like Mass Effect, you're obviously, obviously liking the choice mechanic... And that's all that Telltale is. So anyway, yeah, uh, I recommend that you give Witcher 3 another shot and get into it. Uh, it may not be for you, but that is the number one recommendation I have. I was just I so have. bored because like, I didn't care about finding this one woman, and I didn't care about the griffin, and like, I'm like, what? Does, does you didn't get past that point? Yeah, I didn't kill the griffin yet because I was like, I okay, because uh, I had to go talk to like 20 people. Hey, uh, Biofan, Biofan, yeah. go kill the griffin. Okay. Go kill the that, griffin. That is the hinterlands. That is the of hinterlands Witcher of Witcher Three. 3. Okay. Go kill um, the griffin. But no, another one that's hey, about. Hey, Biofan, go kill the griffin. Okay. Another right. one that's about choice. That again is a side-scrolling kind of story game. That there's no dialogue, but there's text. But there's no dialogue. Is uh this war of mine? If you've ever heard of that, that is probably the most depressing game you can ever play. Excellent way to cheer people up. It, it it takes it's a side scrolling game where you have to keep this sh- group of sur- people alive. It it takes place in a war, but you're not playing like an action person of Call of Duty. Instead, you're playing these civilians that are just stuck in a war torn area, and you have to find food, shelter, uh, make sure your people aren't sick. If they're injured, make sure they're uh, not getting diseases from. T- uh, cuts wounds and as the as it becomes night you send people out to scavenge and you break into people's houses and you're scavenging for food and like the one example is you find this elderly couple's house where they don't attack you but this guy follows you around saying please don't take please don't take our food my wife needs that or don't take the medication my wife needs that to live please don't take it and you know it's you can 
be nice to the AI and let that be there or taken. Can you have your people survive? And if you take in when you come back, your person's now depressed. So you have to figure out how to make him feel better while the other people that are with you are like, I can't believe he took this stuff, but we need it to. It's it's about choices that you make, but it's de- there's no winning. It's depressing. It sounds very interesting. Also sounds like I'm not sure I want to play it because of that. <laughs> it If you want to feel like a piece of shit, <laughs> yeah. that's the game to get. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's... But it's a really, really good game. I tend to pretty much just stick with RPGs. It's rare that I'll kind of veer off. Have you played uh, Stick of Truth, the South Park I RPG game? I have not played it yet. If you like South Park, I'd recommend that game. Okay. It's pretty funny. The, the other, I, I like a bunch of different other the kinds of games. New uh, one is coming out soon. The uh, the other game, and it's sort of a, one of the things I like, I like action games, action RPGs, regular RPGs. I like real or turn-based strategy games a lot, like a lot, which is why I brought up Civ Six at the beginning of this. But uh, if you haven't played... If you haven't played FTL and you were at all Ooh, interested in, uh, in turn-based strategy games, it's not quite turn-based, but it, you can pause whenever. It's also space. It's space. There's other alien and races. You, you get choices and you have crew members that die and it's a small-scale version of I like, Mass Effect uh, in oh, a way. And you want to know something that I really love about that game? Oxygen actually makes a difference. <laughs> Your characters die if there's no if there isn't the correct amount of oxygen in areas. Weird, huh? But all the aliens right? breathe oxygen. I thought you had a problem with that. Well, no, some of them don't. One of them doesn't. Oh well, yeah, there you go. Okay, but there are characters in Mass Effect that don't breathe oxygen. Like what? Like the Volus. They don't breathe oxygen. I'm very certain they don't breathe oxygen. But the Darth Vader thing and everything. Okay, what well, are, you, what are they breathing? What are they? Yeah, no, we, we we've had this conversation before. So oh, and did we uh, find an answer? They breathe. No, ammonia but they are on like a ammonia based environment. So we're oh, not okay. gonna get the answer on this. But I'm pretty uh, sure they don't well. drink oxygen. Well, maybe. If whatever. They whatever. Were to I want to move on. In Andromeda, we will find that out. We got to move on before huh. we get trapped in this again. Okay. But <laughs> that kind of is a segue to uh, to science. Yes. Science! This is. We wanted to talk about science. We teased the science topic like a month and a half ago. Uh, and we're going to talk about it now. This basically came from a conversation in one of the videos that one of us did uh, between Biofan and I talking about the Helios Cluster, which is where the game's going to take place. Uh, and the Helios Cluster is a cluster of stars, hundreds, they say hundreds of stars, that's thousands of light years across. And it might depend on, we're talking about cluster density. Okay, can I jump in here? You, Yeah, I was waiting for you to jump in, actually. Okay. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> okay, so um, Andromeda is like 2,200,000 2, light years in diameter. And then, and, and then um, the Milky Way is only 100,000. So it's a little bit over double in terms of physical size for the whole galaxy. But then, in density, it has about, oh, uh, like, okay, so the amount of stars in the Milky Way is debated between 100 billion to 400 billion, with 100 billion being the most accepted in the scientific I believe, community. I believe 200 billion is now the most accepted, but Did we don't need to Did they change it that. in the last few it's months? Been, it's been 200 and for a while. Because I made a video only a few yeah, months ago. I, I saw your video, but I, I looked at this for a while. 200 to 400 is generally accepted okay. range. But but the point is is that, man, There's, a, a, Andromeda don't has know. a trillion of them. A trillion that's also, stars. That's tr- also debated, but yeah, higher yeah, towards I mean, they can't go in and count all of them. So You can't count to a trillion? It's a master debate. <laughs> the The biggest issue there is like you got a bunch of stars <laughs> that are together. Are you, like, I don't find that funny, but so it's just really late. You have about <laughs> <laughs> so you have about a little bit over double the amount of space, but you also have a trillion stars instead of like two hundred, one hundred billion stars. So they're all closer together. So it's more densely packed. So systems would be closer together. Now here's why I wanted to bring that up. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a theory, and we don't know this for sure because we have never found life anywhere else, so we don't really know what conditions are needed. But ideally, as far as we know, life's to cr- the way life's created 
it is not conducive to life to be around a whole bunch of stars because stars have a tendency to explode. And if they yeah, explode, they, they will wipe out or seriously disrupt life in their immediate area. So the most more stars that are closely packed into an area, the more likely there is to be a supermassive star that explodes and does damage supernova, to life. Supernova, right? Yeah, supernova. No, it does damage to all the life in the area. Well, and maybe, look, Minius, you just found the major conflict of Andromeda is we that that stuff I, is exploding. You totally stole my so, thunder. The <laughs> thunder has been stolen. That is where I was going with, which why the remnant have been wiped out. Could be a supernova. Maybe. I'll, theoretically, if you move faster in life, you can get away from a supernova. But in essence, you know, why we talking about like technological difficulties and technological progression, where in the Milky Way, your technological progression as a species is cut off after 50,000 years, period, because of the Reapers. But in Andromeda, it's not. Maybe the reason that the people in the Andromeda don't technologically progress is because they're in a denser area and because they get cut off by the environment of so many stars packed together so often. Just a postulation. I'm just, rem- I'm just remembering that Courage the Cowardly Dog episode. Where he had to drive into the sun and he changed the light bulb that was inside the sun because it was dying. Science! <laughs> <laughs> right? Why did it take that in a super unscientific direction? Dude, Courage the Cowardly Dog was the best thing. Okay. Okay. So, I, I can't dispute that. But Can I jump in now? <laughs> Aha. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah, go. Okay, go. so the Milky Way is 13 billion years old. Andromeda is 9 billion years old. Younger, but bigger. So, we don't really know when... Do we know when exactly the Reapers were created and started destroying everything? We do not know exactly. Uh, the, it's unknown. It's unknown, but it's a bazillion years ago. The window actually is very closer to... It's closer to a billion. Okay. Well, actually, um, I was going I was going to say the timeline uh, for Mass Effect is unknown to a billion BC. Because... The unknown part where the Leviathans and everything, and they created the, uh, creating the Reapers, but at 1 billion BC was when the Leviathan of Dis, when the Leviathan of Dis is killed by the Leviathans. It is noted at 1 billion BC. It's basically Leviathan of Dis is a proto-Reaper before the very first harvest. So the spot that you're talking about is the war between the Leviathans and the the being that became the Reapers. Okay, so that's I'm assuming... I'm assuming that one billion is a very vague number. Uh, that's okay. oh, I'm sure it's not yeah. exact. Okay, well, but, anyway, you know, it's okay. The reason why I asked is because if you look at Andromeda, that's nine billion years old, and they don't that we know of, and hopefully, hopefully not, they don't have reapers, so they don't have that fifty thousand year cycle thing. So there's been about one hundred and eighty thousand cycles that have never happened, but that doesn't include the time it took for life to start up and whatnot. So, they either, they don't have Reapers, so they don't have the Reapers to give them the um, technology f- from, like, the mass relays that helped the Milky Way races advance faster, but they have existed without Reapers wiping them out every 50,000 years, so I don't know how technologically advanced compared to us they'll be. I want to say maybe it kind of evens out of no Reapers but no mass relays to, you know to be like equal to well, us well and i think they could have something there that has been wiping out their version of the reapers yeah but that'd I, be I so they don't. cheap like that be yeah i hope they don't that would but be so you know, cheap. there could be there i mean there could be unless it's the suns like unless that. it's the suns exploding that's different enough that i'm okay we're, with that yeah we're also talking about there's the remnant who are clearly more advanced than you otherwise mm-hmm. the game's well, gonna uh, be really boring <laughs> i mean uh, there well what about the idea of you know the that stuff is what you said nine billion years old. Andromeda as um, it, as a galaxy is nine billion years old. We don't know when life started up and what. I believe but, that's an that's an estimation too. Yeah, I mean it's not exactly, but it's it's close as we know in science. So we know day. about that, but what about specifically the creation of the Helios cluster? Couldn't that be at a different time? So the one thing about the Andromeda galaxy that we've noticed is that it's so big that it's possibly a bunch of galaxies have been sucked into it. There's another galaxy nearby called M31. It's got a real name. I think it's M31 or M33. That's getting sucked into it, too. We know that's 
both the Milky Ways pulled in, so there could be... Yeah, there's Milky Ways pulled in galaxies as well. What Biofan and I postulated is that if they're heading to Andromeda directly, the quickest way to get to a, a, a cluster is to just stop at the edge. Yeah, just go to the edge, yeah. It's called the uh, Triangulum Triangulum, galaxy. thank you. Triangulum is next door to it. And it's and a big it is galaxy. believe that it's in orbit around uh, Andromeda is going to crash into it. Andromeda mm-hmm. also going to crash into the Milky Way at some point. They're heading right Yeah, but we are going to be yeah, long. <laughs> That's it's, like... Well, also, not just that, but the chances of any planet hitting the other I saw that, is yes. astronomical. Isn't that crazy that you could yeah. have a trillion star galaxy crash into like a 300... 200 billion star galaxy and have none of the and stars have no crash. planet hit. I don't understand. Yeah. That's crazy. I think that's, I think that's gravity and forces and physics and whatnot is the reason why. Well, it's also just the, the sheer size. Of, I mean, space is huge. I don't know if you noticed. Space yeah, I don't is know really, if you noticed, really but it's big. Kind of, it's kind of massive. So, so this is only helpful to people in California, but as a guide, if you were to put the sun and the closest star to the earth in a proportional scale, if you put down a grain of sand in Los Angeles that represents the sun to sky to size, you'd have to put a grain of sand down in San Francisco to be the next star. That's the proportions we're talking about. It's like 600 miles. Do you mi- know how many, like, yeah, I was it's like 300 say, miles between grains of sand. So that's how they can crash into each other without actually crashing into each other. Yeah, that's amazing. So here's one more thing that's along this line and has kind of been what we've been talking about. Are you guys familiar with the Fermi Paradox? Yes. Yes, but I'm sure there are people listening that have no idea what you're talking about. So basically, uh, there was a group of scientists that were together at lunch and they were working out the probability that there is life in the universe. And the numbers are so overwhelmingly in favor of life in the universe that they pretty much assume that they there has to be life, right? I mean, we mentioned what there's 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. And there might be 200 Andromeda. billion galaxies. Uh, it yeah. actually there was an re- article that came out a couple days ago talking about how that might actually be 10 percent of the universe. There might actually be, you know, trillions of galaxies out there, one to two trillion galaxies. So life probably exists somewhere. So uh, one of the scientists named Fermi asked, "So if life is out there, where is everybody?" If the math says they should be there and they're not there, why is that? And that's the Fermi paradox. And a number of reasons have been postulated towards this, but we get into the most common one, or at least the most popular one, was talking about that societies reach a level where they can destroy themselves. I mean, aren't... aren't I, I remember a while ago, scientists are working on stuff of how to make black holes i'm like that's how we destroy ourselves that's how yeah, we right? end the human race either that or you know how a bunch of countries around the world now have Nukes. nuclear yeah. weapons life would still go on just not our life it would be a planet dominated by cockroach people it would eventually become the cockroach yeah people i mean this planet. is a decent point where we can wipe ourselves out so did the remnant wipe themselves out is that why they're not there is that why these... It could be. Maybe you can get to a certain point. And interestingly enough, as far as that theory goes, and I, Fermi didn't suggest that. There are other possible reasons. But interestingly enough, life in the Milky Way continued to wipe itself out in the Mass Effect universe. Mm-hmm. They created machines that destroyed them. That is in the lore. And isn't, isn't one of the theories very similar to the story of Mass Effect is that there is something out there stopping life from... Kind of doing a cycle thing? That's quite possible. Is that one of the theories as well? I think the the most likely reason, and this isn't quite topical, is that faster than light travel might be impossible. And if it is, then we're so far away, as we mentioned with these stars, you can't reach that. But also, I like, the, the chance I like to, to think that... I don't want that to be true. I like to think that it's other races have noticed us. They're just smart enough to go, eh. <laughs> they, they, they look at us and they seem like amoebas or something. Or, I mean... Here's the thing, like, what do we recognize as life? There could be things that do live on other planets that we don't perceive as life. I agree with that. There's definitions. I mean, there are things There are things on Earth that they live and die so quickly that we don't really perceive them as ever living. And there could be something out there that, could be the reverse of that of it lives for so 
long that they don't that notice it us. Moves. Yeah, that's that's also a possibility. So you know they they could be I don't know uh, out at a planet that's past Pluto, like past what we can get a good glance at, and they could not recognize us as life. So they are not going to go over here. The the one thing with there, this Fermi paradox though, that I wanted to, to bring it to actually do you have something the continuation of that Tucker? Yeah, I was going to say there's a quote that I r- absolutely love, and it is there are two possibilities. Either life exists somewhere else, or it doesn't. Both possibilities are equally terrifying. Cool. Who said that? I remember that quote. I like that quote a lot. Uh, I don't know. I remember who you're, said you're that. You're quoting it from memory, right? Like, it just sticks with you. I um, The reason I'm remembering that is because I was uh, replaying XCOM, and that's the opening quote of the game. I want to say Stephen Hawking said that, but that's a guess. Because I believe I saw it in a Stephen Hawking documentary, but he may not have come up with that. I might. Science is an old. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm googling that right now. But I, when whenever you load a new game of XCOM, that's the opening quote. Oh, it's a uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke, science the, fiction writer. The exact quote right. is: Two possibilities exist. Either we are, are. Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. That is the exact quote. By the way, another game that if you like tactical strategy RPGs uh, that have story and consequences and stuff, XCOM, good game to play. Go check it out. Okay, we've mentioned oh, yeah. it on the show before. It's pretty good. So the thing I talked oh, about yeah. earlier on how there are like definitions for a living organism, um, I had to look it up because I was like, I know some of them, but I probably won't remember all of them on the spot. They have to respond to some form of stimuli, have to be able to reproduce, have to be able to grow and develop, and have to be able to maintain homeostasis. Those are all life as we recognize as it. As we recognize it, yeah. 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 There could be th- things out there that don't recognize us as life. So they might not come over here. because like their definition of life is different, you're saying? Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, they, because they're not, in, they're not, they don't communicate with each other the way we do because they don't move the way we do that. They're not life. That's just you mean like something beyond we don't con- care. A beyond yeah. conceivability kind of for us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like I, I can't even like think of examples uh, as that being an example. Or, um, is... If you think about um, in um, what's the movie? Um, kind of a cop out, but you know. <laughs> what's the movie? Oh gosh, what was it? Um, Interstellar. On how? Um, have you guys seen it? No, I actually haven't seen it because I was told not to. But I thought it was really oh, good wow. until like the last ten minutes. But do you want me? To, do you mind me spoiling it for you for this concept? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So Spoilers. Humans, <laughs> Go humans ahead. eat like some billion bajillion years in the future have technology to kind of like help us along to get further through to like progress and leave Earth and go on and whatnot because the world is ending. Um, so they are so evolved compared to us that they actually live and see in more than three dimensions. So that's kind of a different way. You can't even conceive what life like what life must be like for them because they live in more than three dimensions. That kind of reminds me of a really cool kind of idea or concept is that the second that time travel is created, like the absolute millisecond that once time travel is created, then time travel was created throughout our entire life because the second it's created means that we had the ability to go back in time and create time travel before the time it was created. Well, technically it is possible, but you can only move forward. Well, he's talking about backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Science fiction. But it's just, it's just, you know, this is kind of a cool thought is the absolute second that time travel is created. Then we have had time travel throughout all of humanity's existence. Cool. To go backwards because you can go forwards. Yeah. Technically. Well, obviously, we're going forward right now. <laughs> oh, one thing. Can I can I throw in a, a yeah, different thing? Yeah, go. Okay. Throw so stuff. So, one thing. I am, I'm curious as to... So, we know, according to Aaron Flynn, that we flee the Milky Way. Um, and we've talked about reasons why we're leaving before. But I think... I find it interesting how we're going to Andromeda, supposedly, from what we know, ye old fashioned way of just going faster than the speed of light, straight to Andromeda... 
why are we going to Andromeda if it's so friggin' far away? And there are other small galaxies, such as the Sagittarius galaxy, which is like 61 light years away, and it's actually so close that it's being sucked into the Milky Way right now. So I'm wondering why we're not going somewhere closer. Probably because um, Andromeda is a well-known word, and it's marketable, and money, and whatnot. Probably. What do you guys think? Other than logic. Because we're on the topic of science, I wanted to kind of talk about... Oxygen. Uh, <laughs> Why do well, people breathe oxygen? Always, I will always I will always bring up oxygen <laughs> and just how absolutely <laughs> little sense it makes that every single race that's on the Citadel, none of them have, besides like the Corians and the Volus, none of them have a breathing thing. So you are telling okay. me... Like, you know, the Elcor, humans, Turians, okay, Solarians, uh, sorry, everything breathes the exact same amount of oxygen. Okay, Tugger. Yes. They don't have to breathe the same amount of oxygen. No, but you know, there if you go up in the mountains, levels, you have to have an oxygen Earth. tank. You just have a minimum requirement. So there may feel... be like a shit ton more than what humans need. But, but still, I, like I feel bad amount... for bringing this up because we've had this actual conversation on Andromeda's before. So I got to steer you guys away I from will, this. Okay. I know. Medius, what, but, what are we talking about next? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. I, no, because I, I was going to talk about what it was this. What is this? Um, that uh, Michio Kaku's, uh, he has like an eight minute video talking about the science of Mass Effect and it relating to things nowadays. And I, I kind of summarized a lot of things and just kind of uh, going through the topics. And then see how we feel uh, as I talk about each topic. The first one is Invisibility Cloak. And he believes that in a few decades, we will be able to create something that actually resembles the Harry Potter Invisibility Cloak. We already did. It already exists. Well, he talks about microwave radiation. And we can already make things disappear. That it can wrap around an object and reform at the other end and make it appear that you aren't there at all. But it's not a big scale but they hope to be able to make a cylinder out of this and that the uh, military are working on it right now. How scary is that? But no, they invented the yeah. invisibility. It was like some university invented. Oh, I, uh, like, yeah, I, I also want to point out that this was this interview was created uh, when Mass Effect 2 is released. Okay, yeah, it so, was definitely after that. 2010, mm -hmm. right? Early 2010. About that time. About that time. So, you know, uh, there are something... It's been six years, so science has improved since then. But... Proved quite a lot. Yeah, that's... I mean, I, I yeah. saw that, and it makes it makes sense. Like, that's actually a thing that could happen. There's some things in Mass Effect that are a little crazy, and things in other science effect things that are closer to magic, but that's something that could happen, and that's really creepy. There's a dude in your room. Look around. You can't find him. He's in a magic barrel. That's not actually magic. It's science. He's just staring mm -hmm. at you. He's still staring at and, you. And uh, that's that's what he says about the invisibility cloaks. When uh, asked about biotics, he says, um, you know, he talks about when people think about psychokinesis, they think of gods or superheroes. But with EEG scans and MRI scans, we are basically decoding or we are decoding the basic operating system of the mind that right now we can hook a computer up hook someone up to a computer, and can move objects. And he says that in the future, we'll have conductors on objects and use our mind that will activate a computer within the object that will then move it. That's not quite biotics, but yeah, the similar... Well, it's moving things with your mind so it's, and... it's like technology-based. It's a computer brain interface that's... I mean, I'm not sure how much... Uh, Michio Kaku has played Mass Effect, but maybe when not he's at kind all. Of told, <laughs> yeah. When he's told, kind of, because the person says biotics let people move things around. Yeah, is what he they says. They can edit it up to where they explain it all to him, or show him a clip. Yeah, that's true. But you never see that in the footage. So I mean, we edit a lot but, in this podcast. Yeah, but exactly. that that would be in, along the lines of we actually don't edit as much as you think. Uh, but more than be along the lines of uh, <laughs> I, more tech. I wouldn't abilities. know because I don't watch the stuff. <laughs> I hate you, Tucker. We put so much work into this. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm totally in kidding. This. I'm not. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next one is dark matter, which is uh, Michio Kaku's speciality, and he says that dark matter is the cutting edge of science right now. That there is dark matter all around us. But scientists haven't found dark matter, but they hope to create it using the Hydron Collider. 
And dark energy is even better. It is intergalactic. Before yes. you before you get too far, what is dark matter? Uh, it's the energy of nothing. Is it's that the, what is that? So if you look at it, it is the energy of nothing. Okay, I've heard a different. I've heard different explanations. If of you that. look at space, it's all the empty stuff because they've put no, in like simulators. Yeah, that's not, of he, that's not well, true. No, he no he says that seventy three percent of the universe is made of dark energy. Yeah, it's all the empty stuff, and it, that is what is pushing okay, the galaxy apart. Dark energy and dark matter are different things, as far as we understand. Yes. Twenty well, twenty three percent is made of dark matter, while humans only make point zero three percent of the known universe. Most of the universe is dark. So basically, if you're listening to this and you're a total science novice and you're like not as geeky, uh, dark matter, dark energy are things that we can see impacting the universe. But I mean, we, we can see the impact, but we can't see them. So you're like, hey, things are moving apart, but we don't know why. That's dark energy. Dark energy, we can see it. If you look out into space and you're seeing the empty, like kind of like empty blackness, that's dark. From my understanding, no, that's dark no, energy. That's, we can see it. We're gonna get someone it, who's really smart there, but you can't I'm see dark oh, energy. Oh, I hope so. I really hope. I hope. I hope someone in the comment is. You can't see dark energy, but you can see the effect of dark energy. Yeah, because it's the energy of nothing. I'm pretty sure dark matter and dark energy are both make up the empty blackness of the universe. Empty blackness is generally just nothing, but the matter itself has a gravitational pull. Yeah. Dark matter itself, which is why when if you were to run a calculation of the galaxy and why it's spinning around towards the center, obviously gravity is holding the galaxy together and there's an enormous supermassive black hole at the center. But even with all that gravity, mathematically, all these stars should still break apart. So that's how we know that there's additional matter. They... They've run simulations, and that's how they figured out initially, like, there has to be something there, because they've put in just all that we know is there in, like, a simulation, and basically, like, everything just implodes and goes to... But when you put in the when you put in the dark matter and the dark energy, then it all functions how it's supposed to. I'm really hoping that someone is in the comment section, like, disproving all of our science stuff. I totally welcome it. I'm, I'm totally welcome to accuracy. Bring it on. I mean, in my history videos, I absolutely love that's like, actually, the image that you're showing is the 170-something famine, while the one that you talk about is the uh, potato famine, and then, like, goes into specifics. I love those. I absolutely love those. I love being not, not like, disproven of, oh, well, you're an asshole because I think this, but I love it when people are like, actually, if you look at this statistics, it shows this. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah, and I agree with that. Just don't be a ginormous dick. Although about I, it. yeah, I I hate the things of oh what with the history. If you start with some like you fucking idiot, and then make write well, a no. comment, I ignore you. But if you show me a mistake that I've made, I am more receptive to it. Yeah, same here. I'm, I yeah. I love it. Even like I I know in the first history comparison, I said that the Protheans created the Citadel. I know I got that wrong. I've noticed that one. That's fine. That was that was a fuck up on my end, but. The in like the history part two where people are saying, oh, you mentioned birth control and cardboard boxes, but you don't mention the other world wars. The point of the video was to compare massive like the timeline of Mass Effect to our timeline and nothing interesting in Mass Effect was happening then. So like those disprovements, I, I ignore those. Okay, what? But what was when, anyway, yeah, back, back on topic. Yeah. If you oh. want to chat about dark matter, dark energy with any of us, I imagine. Hit us up in the comment section and we can chat about it because that stuff's fascinating. Actually, something that'd be really cool is if we, if someone in the comment section is like a PH, <laughs> rare chance, if there's like a someone that is a PhD in some form of science. And they're beside or, themselves uh, after our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, oh my God. If, if they are like in the comments, bringing them onto the podcast that'd be very and cool. actually like having them talk about the science that'd be cool i know some scientists through playing mass effect 3 multiplayer but i believe they you know very specific fields there's a lot of science going oh, i on. could pull my high and, um, school physics teacher in she's awesome you want me to oh and uh <laughs> let's get michio kaku actually on the podcast i think we need to do a little bit better but we'll work on it <laughs> and uh another one that he actually talks about are the mass effect relays and he says that scientists believe that we can use something called negative matter which is something like the dilithium crystals in Star Trek. 
would be something that would allow us to open up gateways to the fabric of space and time. Ionized equa- or ionized equations have loopholes. When you put negative matter into ionized equations, everything gets wonky. It creates gateways. They are very unstable, but he thinks that negative matter is the mass effect. It is what it, the relays are using, that they are using um, negative matter. Which is, from what I understand, the basis of the mass effect science is based off of real theoretical science. Where yeah, that basically mass effect relays are wormholes, and that is how they are traveling around so fast as they're going through wormholes. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's actually very, very close to that. Um, I don't know if they use wormholes specifically, but the idea is that if there is, n- if you are not, if you don't have any mass, you can move faster than light. So they came up with the element zero, which allows you to drastically reduce the mass of any object, allowing you to go faster than light. And those uh, mass relays, in essence, create a corridor of completely mastery space, which is just like a wormhole, pretty much. This is all that. And something that is really cool is he says that some forms of teleportation are capable now, but only on an atomic level. Yeah, I saw that. I want teleportation really bad. Yeah, but like, so we can we can actually teleport things, but only on an atomic level. And it's not even teleportation. It is, we can destroy an atom that's here and create a clone of that atom over here. It's not teleporting it. It's destroying it and creating a clone. So what you're saying is every time we go through a mass relay, our shepherd dies and a new one is formed that is the exact same. Well, no, no. That I'm talking about what we're, what we're doing, what we can do now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Real life. So, like, you know, <laughs> teleportation, it's not even... Isn't that like a theory of Star Trek is that whenever they get beamed up that they are literally killing the people and just creating clones? Yeah, that's, I think that, well, it may not be with Star Trek specifically, but that is common That is with dark. that kind of yeah. teleportation. And uh, the last last part of the video, he notes that currently we are a type zero civilization, that we get our energy from dead plants, that we are and dead dinosaurs. years, well, yeah, Just that dead we stuff. are a hundred years away from a type one, which is like Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon, which is a planetary civilization. After that is type two, which is colonizing a few stars, which is what Mass Effect is. It is a type two civilization. And after that goes to type three, which is galactic civilizations like Star Wars. Hey, what's up? Mass Effect Andromeda type three. So Mass Mass Effect is a type two civilization, which is set as you're colonizing a few stars and that, you know, you're competing with others colonizing new areas that it not... Every single thing is colonized. Although, you know, in Star Wars, they're still colonizing new areas that they're still unknown places, but it's a galactic civilization that they're in Mass Effect. There's the Solarians, the Asari and everything like that. While in Star Wars, they are all together in a sense. Science. And that's going basing off my limited Star Wars knowledge. If you have any questions about science and how it relates to Mass Effect... You should email us at andromenerds at gmail.com, which we will now read a bunch of questions from, because is there anything I should know? You have unread messages at your private terminal. What's up, Kelly? Yeah, uh, Ramon, or Ramon, Rujigata? His last name is R U I J G T, and I, 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 yeah, I have to see it on a. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce that. Oh, hey, uh, before we get to his question, did you guys do questions in nine point five? No, we just no, we, we did quickly, not. So yeah, sweet. So his question is: What are your top three favorite soundtracks in the Mass Effect series? You mean songs? Yeah, I, I, soundtracks. Well, soundtracks, if you're going to go with the top three soundtrack, a soundtrack is all the songs in a game. So my top three soundtracks would be Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, guess, I, th- I, th- I think he meant songs. Uh, let's just go with uh, like what's your song. favorite specific track yeah. from the Mass Effect? Uh, what are your three favorites? I don't know if I can come up with three off the top of my head because I know the tracks, but I don't have names associated okay, with them. Okay. I, I think I got three. 
Leaving Earth is my favorite. Um, then my second favorite is probably the map theme. It's not technically on the CD, but it's a yeah, track. It actually um, is on the CD. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, and you're, then, you're talking about Uncharted Worlds. That's the only one I know because that's by far my favorite. And then I think my third favorite would probably be like Future for the Krogan. That one's really good. Yeah, I was. I would say Future for the Krogan, an end once and for all, and the uh, Suicide Mission Ooh. track. Hmm. So I'd have to like listen to these I, all again and pick up and like, oh yeah, it's that one. Actually, Mass Effect Follower has a video on this of nine tracks to remember of the top three soundtracks voted for by the community in a poll that I like made a thousand times. Uh, but unselfish plug. The go. top three sound. Oh yeah, <laughs> the top three soundtracks of each channel. Go check that one out. Uh, yeah, I I really like the Mass Effect soundtrack. I can't wait to uh, hear what the Andromeda music is like. I can't wait. I love. Like I, I love listening to the soundtracks, but when it comes to editing, it's really difficult to find soundtracks that don't, you know, go ten seconds all nice and calm and ten seconds very loud. Yeah, it's hard to find one that you can talk over. That's why I do the map theme all the time because it's really easy yeah. to talk over. Yeah, Pe- people ask like, why are you using this one again? It's very difficult to find, to edit crazy tracks that go all around. Yeah, the so Mass Effect typically... soundtrack when you buy it specifically, they go up and down and up and down. It's not. Yeah, there there are a few of them that are decent. I've edited a few to make it to where the de- like the up parts are still kind of de- like it's a lot of time to do it to make it background music. But the map theme is really easy to do. With Dragon Age, I had to like go in and edit a bunch of stuff to make it to where I could talk over it easily. It takes a lot to, and there are rare moments where if it really fits the video that I will take the time to do that. Like the Mass Effect Paragon Lost, uh, none of the Paragon Lost songs were even, so I took a long time to do that. But for the most part, I'll just throw on a Future for the Krogan or an End Once and For All because those are nice, Yeah, those are nice, even easy to talk ones. over. Yeah. And they're also very good. Yeah, they're also so. beautiful, yeah. And I don't use Mass Effect music because I'm scared. <laughs> no, they'll let you. What do you do? I, I understand that, but I like my own music, so I use okay. that. You guys like the song at the beginning of Andromeda Nerds, right? Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, I dance that's, that's it every a, time. That's a mini <laughs> point. I picked that one out. You know, you know what's unfortunate about that song? What? So I, I pick out a hmm. lot of songs from a podcast service, and they always have, at the very least, the name of the song and the artist. The name of our song at the beginning of this podcast, there is no name, and there is no artist. I don't know who it's by. Like, I picked it out, and it was so good. I Normally, I would pass over something that I couldn't actually credit to somebody. But I believe it's like the name of the track is Positive Electronic Upbeat something. Okay. Right. That's it. And there's no artist. I don't know. I who think that's it. also the name of my ringtone, but I'm not quite sure. Hold on. I want to get this exact name. It's If somebody, if you wrote this song, let me know because I want to give you credit. <laughs> it's an awesome song. Positive Electronic Theme Soft. That is our theme song. <laughs> I dance to it every time during editing. I'm like, do, 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 do. <laughs> All right, what, el- what else do we got as questions right. go? Dave Brinkus, uh, uh, this one's a decent length, so you know, stay back. But when the game finally comes out, I imagine that it'll take quite a while for everyone to complete. Do you guys have plans to release videos in episode format that is somehow permission to prevent later story spoilers or on- only talk about general stuff? Or will everyone wait to complete the game to resume take it, talking about it in a complete review? I am very fearful of having the game accidentally spoiled by the internet. So That's completely understandable. So leave and, the internet oh yeah. until you finish the game, because otherwise it's impossible, I mean, I don't, first of all. I don't know about you guys. I really don't want Mass Effect and Drama to spoiled, but I'm going to be looking at every single comment in my video feed and removing spoilers like i will i'll have the game spoiled for myself just so some person in the comment doesn't go oh the dad dies i'm gonna i'm gonna try i'm gonna mission. try my very best i'm just gonna leave yeah, the internet but, until i finish the first i think playthrough. for the first month or so i'll i'll have disclaimers and stuff but as far oh, as yeah, how d- to cover I mean, this stuff individually i mean we're all going to be doing it different i imagine yeah depends yeah. on what kind of videos I, you want to do i have not 100 percent decided if i'm going to play all the way through it as a let's play because i haven't done those before, and I know people really like yeah. them, but there's a bunch of people let's playing it. But one thing I think we should do, 
is we should have an Andromeda Nerds Mass Effect Andromeda spoiler cast. Multiplayer. And we should have it with, and we should also do like, I know you just talked about Let's Plays. I think we should do like a few rounds of multiplayer to yeah, all together yeah. and record that. Okay, multiplayer so is different, but I, I think we will need to discuss this. Yeah. but Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely discuss it. It's a good question. We are definitely sensitive to spoiling the game for you. I do not want to spoil this game yeah. for you. I mean, I do not want to do that. I know that when the game comes out, I'm still going to be making the same amount of videos that my channel is still going to produce, the same amount of videos as they do, and it's going to be very difficult to make a non-spoiler video like two days after the game comes yep. out. So, you know, on, on all of our things, we'll say, warning, this might spoil the game. All right, well, it depends on what you make your video about, because depending on what you do, it's obvious that it's going to contain spoilers or not. Well, I mean, just think gameplay in the background might show something if you talk about say you do a lore video on like the remnant that might well, spoil then it's the obvious game that there's spoilers in there and they shouldn't watch that yeah, until they finish uh, the game that's on them tucker it's not on you it's on them no to... I, I understand oh, yeah. being sensitive if you have if you want to talk about how you would prefer for us to go about things on andromeda nerds as far as spoilers are concerned when it comes to mass effect andromeda let us know in the comment section or email us at andromeda nerds at gmail.com I'm curious. When do you guys think that a it, it is free to talk about spoilers in a game without having to war, uh, give the a warning? The grace period's about five to six months. Yeah, it's long. Really? Yeah. That's way too big. That's way too the big for me. The grace period for like general discussion anywhere online is like five to six months. But for this, I think honestly, people should just know that the game came out, and if they haven't played it, then don't listen to us. Be a little surprised if people who are listening to us. Don't play the game as soon as possible. Yeah. Or at least w to watch like a Let's Play or something. Pretty sure they're going to be playing the game when it comes out after listening to us. Or a, yeah. a, or a, like a week after it comes out at most. But we're all going to be busy playing it, so we'll probably have to take a break from the podcast until we all beat it. We'll, we'll figure and, something out. It, yeah. This is a question oh. that... If, what, we have five months at least? Yeah, we have. Yeah, so yeah. we will Wild address time. this as we go on... Uh, specifically talking about where you want the podcast to go once the game releases. Uh, for the moment, we got all kinds of promotional stuff to cover starting in a couple weeks, so we're going to concentrate on yeah. that. I mean, my, my kind of rule of thumb is a lot shorter than you guys. For me, it's for a movie, two weeks, and for a game, four weeks. After four weeks, you can talk about a game. I will probably be doing spoilers quicker than that, but I will be doing spoiler videos, yeah. You're talking about with no warnings? Yeah, without warnings. Okay. Yeah, I, they, After four weeks, you can just talk about it. I do not have an official apology, uh, policy. I have yeah, had I one channel either. in my lifetime. It, it depends on one. what I want to do. Cause it, yeah. I mean, if they haven't played the game yet, it's on them. You know? I, I mean, for me, it's like for a TV show, if it's like the opening, say, like Walking Dead, when that airs, you know, uh, I'd say a few days. But for a movie, two weeks before you could just openly talk about spoilers without someone going, oh, I haven't seen it yet. Well, that's on you. And then for a game, four weeks. And, like, our listeners so. will probably be busy playing Andromeda and not listening to us until they beat Andromeda. Exactly, So right? I don't think we need to worry about it at all. I, I, I'm not sure about that. I think this is going to become a podcast that people listen to while they're playing multiplayer. Yeah, that, I mean, that's... what. I, I I would listen to the uh, Rooster Teeth podcast, both uh, the regular one and the patch, uh, while playing multiplayer. Like I like I said, this is a this is a an excellent question that we will address in detail when the time comes. We're still a little bit far out. All right, uh, Jay Thomas has a pretty simple question of uh, what do you want the pilot of the Tempest to be like? Do you want someone like Joker again, or something other than that? Humorous, but with a different kind of humor. That's tough. That's tough to say. I mean, it really depends on all the personalities that are with you. Because I don't want another Joker. Because we have that. That's Joker. I don't want another Joker. I want something different. But I love Joker because he the jokes and how just well, awesome he was. Well, you can have totally different personality and humor style to where you won't even feel like it's associated with Joker at all. Like Joker's humor was kind of more the immature, sarcastic y kind of. This one could be different. It's a tough question to answer, really. Yeah. 
All right, uh, the last question we have is from Joe K, which I think is joke because it's J-O-K-E. Um, either way, this person's question is, my question is a simple one, but how do you believe the candidates for the Andromeda program were selected? What skills and talents, aside from them involving military experience, do you believe would have been sought after? Or what about civilians? Do you think civilians have been selected? This is I, a very excellent question. Yeah. But there is enough going on right now that we don't know enough about the program. Like, for instance, if it's they're leaving before the Reapers show up, how many people are actually on board with that? You know what I mean? Because um, there are people that don't believe the Reapers are coming, so they wouldn't work on this. Or they'd want to believe in fighting. So it could be a private organization. Uh, it could be splinter groups from the militaries and... They would all have different ideas on how to go about selecting people. But the basic question is still valid. What kind of people would you want? I feel like, you know, that they would find the people that are fantastic, that they are doing really well, and they off give them an offer of, hey, this is what we're doing, and they can say yes or no, and those that are obviously in Andromeda said yes. And then, because there are multiple arcs, the one of the arcs that is later than all the others would be a civilian arc. Those that well, could pay to get a ticket. It's probably they're all going at the same time, though. I don't think they leave. Well, I would imagine that they would send the military first and then, like, give it a week. It, it looks like they're sending everybody at once. It looks like they're sending everybody at once, really? but the military hmm. one may be in the front. I don't know. But um, in terms of in terms of civilians... It would probably be either wealthy people funded the expedition or they selected people because they were like hyper fertile or something since they're starting a new home for humanity. Or it could be a, a lottery based kind of thing of, you know, people that wanted to be in it. They put their thing in a lottery or a combination of all of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it largely depends on how many people buy into this idea of leaving the Milky Way because we don't we don't know the extent of that. I still think they're fleeing the collectors because I think that makes the most sense. If they're fleeing, I don't why would think they that makes fleeing? sense at all. I still don't think that makes sense. Just try to think of how did in Europe, how did they pick people to go to America? People left on their own, basically. People left on their own to go. Well, yeah, it was it was people left on their own, but when Explore they were on the new world, make money, and it was gold, God, or glory. It were the three Gs. It's not quite but... the same because you can go back and forth. Well, what I'm meaning is, you know, those that would go is, you know, some of them were carpenters that could build and work on housing. And some of them were farmers. So, you know, it's not all going to be military. There's going to be civilians of their version of farm. Yeah, we're going to have everything. If we're building a new civilization, we're going to have like ecological experts. We're going to have scientists of all sorts and shapes and what's nots, militaries, everything. Yeah, you might need a skill to go along and then you can take your family too so i feel like i like you know they're obviously there's obviously going to be civilians but um i imagine that they're going to be have talents and well actually an a, a example for right now the mars program remember when they uh selected out of like fifty thousand candidates six people to go on a one-way expedition to you mars? Mean the mars one one yeah, yeah mars one yeah did they actually yeah, and that? Yeah, who'd they pick? I think they did. I have no memory of that, but they picked people, and I don't think any of them had the same talent. Like, I remember one of them was like a, he was like a PhD in mathematics or something, and like none of the others were big with math. Yeah, obviously you're going to pick the people based on strengths to be the most successful, so you're going to pick people with different strengths. And also a variety so they can try a colonization attempt. And probably some form of fertility testing as well. I remember one guy was really weird. He talked about his masturbation habits. And... Weren't they going to make that a reality <laughs> show? No, they were going to make that a reality show. So they're like, what's weird about you? What can we <laughs> sell? And that would be something that he would go. Yeah, I watched this. That was all like one big joke. And it was just they were grabbing the weird people. Yeah, very possible. But, I, you know, it could be something similar to that of, you know, something that we actually did like a year or two ago. It could be. We don't know the scale of this evacuation. We assume it's very big. 
Uh, we don't know who's in charge of it, although we can make some educated guesses. We don't know what percentage of the people you have to select from. It could be very small. For instance, if they are fleeing the Reapers, not everybody believes the Reapers are coming. In fact, probably most of the galaxy doesn't believe they're coming. But still, the galaxy is enormous, you know, hundreds of billions of people, if not trillions. You're going to find a large population to choose from. There are a whole bunch of factors here. Well, they are leaving difficult. from Earth, at least in that we think. portion of the tra- No, because they've mapped it to part of the trailer. It looks exactly like... Uh, well, they're loading ships on Earth, but are they loading ships other places? That's a good question. That, from what we've seen so far, they're loading people from Earth onto the ships. We know other aliens that contributed are there as well. By but. the way, there is a book coming out called Mass Effect the Andromeda Lost Ark. Did you guys see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the book listings. Let me pull those up. The first one is like Nexus something. Yeah, Nexus Uprising and one called Lost Ark. And the idea that these arcs have to go... I, I imagine they would go in a pack, but if they don't, one could easily get lost. Yeah, the first well, one yeah, is... I mean, space is huge. We, we talked about that. The, ne- the first one is Nexus Uprising, The second, the, and that one's due March 2017, um, according to the Titan treat books these, listing. Yeah, treat these dates with extreme... Because these have changed. Yeah. So these have changed significantly. Titles have changed. Authors have changed. All sorts of change. But um, the Mass Effect Andromeda Nexus Uprising is due for March 2017, which is also when the game is very likely to come out. Um, Andromeda Lost Ark is due for the summer of 2017. And then Mass Effect Andromeda Initiative is due for autumn of 2017. And then the to-be-announced Mass Effect book title is due for summer 2018. But into the idea of arcs, there's still a lot of questions that would change the answer to that specific question we just got. So it's very difficult. It's very interesting. I'm very interested in finding what what happens. But mm-hmm. I think Tucker is pretty straight along the lines where you want to acquire people with skills and as many people with skills as possible in a diverse as a a diverse as as diverse as array whatever the hell. Now I'm I'm breaking down. We've been going for too long. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as many different fields as possible. Uh, for instance, if we were going, uh, we would need someone who was good at biology, because I'm not. Uh, we work on videos. What kind of videos are awesome that you're doing? Something I did recently was I did a massive news update for Mass Effect Andromeda that now has like almost 40,000 views on it, and it's doing really well. And I just hit 10,000 subscribers. Mm. Hey, that's awesome. Woo. So happy. So pumped. Mm. Get it. S- sound effect, go. I'm, uh, well, uh, by the time this comes out, a brand new series on Mass Effect followers come out about what if, which goes over hypothetical scenarios. And the first one that's out is what if the genophage was never created? And it goes over, Ooh. you know, how the war against the Krogans would have played out. Ooh. I'm looking forward to that. Interesting. Uh, yeah. By the way, uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, start tweeting at people. Because we got the Space Bear Initiative going on. Yes! It's very important. It is by far the most important initiative Ever. in the history of initiatives. So Ever. come November, we Ever. need to, we need your vote on the Space Bear Initiative. Ever. Hashtag Space Bear Initiative. Tweet at your favorite Twitter people. Someone Using... tweeted at the President of the United States, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Wait, really? Yeah, I asked people to tweet. I was just thinking random people. And uh, I think it was Blair who tweeted at the president of the United States. So you this can tell uh, him to awesome. tweet at the devs about the Space Bear Initiative. <laughs> this year, uh, you, who's your favorite dev or one tweet of your them. favorite devs? Yeah, tweet your favorite dev. Tweet your favorite about the dev. Space Bear Initiative. Space Bear. It's a very important that you tweet your favorite devs. Hashtag Space Bear Initiative. It's very very important. And for those that are listening to this for the first time and have no idea what we're talking about, so. There was the original T-shirt of the Andromeda Initiative, and everybody was... Oh, no, it was the Pathfinder Initiative that was the first T-shirt, and everybody was like, what's this? And then just recently, 
Yas Hendricks tweeted out an Andromeda Initiative t-shirt. And so we were like, well, apparently there's a lot of initiatives in this game. We'll come up with our own initiative. And we came up with the Space Bear Initiatives. Space Bear Initiative! Space Bear Initiative! From um, that big creature thing in the EA Play trailer, we you mean have been space calling bears. it a Space Bear. And so you mean Space Bears. We need Space Bears. We love Space Bears. Space Bear Initiative! Yeah! I'm actually ex- excited to see what that thing is actually called. It is it's a called a space, space bear. bear. That is it's, its called name. a space bear, Tucker. That is you got to be committed name. to the cause. That is its only name. Its only valid name is space bear. Okay, that's all the nerdiness we've got for today. Join us next week as we break down your Mass Effect art. If you're listening to this, it's probably too late to send something in, but we got lots of cool stuff for you. Two weeks from now, we are doing an N7 day preview show. So make sure you get up on that. It'll be releasing November 3rd. Like four days before, so be sure you watch it in time for N7 day. Correct. If you have any questions for us, Mass Effect related or otherwise, feel free to email us at andromenerds at gmail.com and your questions might be read by Tucker and he probably is going to get your name wrong. I've actually had a few people ask me to mispronounce their name. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Awesome. Dude, they enjoy it. (laughs) Along with our co-hosts, be sure to follow Andromenerds on Twitter if you like this podcast and would like to see some more awesome videos. Be sure to check out and subscribe to our respective channels. Tucker, you got the tiebreaker. <laughs> what? Are you not listening to our important conversation? Are you not listening to this? <laughs> I was watching a cat video. Oh, boy. Were you actually watching a cat video? Or? It was a cat video. Oh, you Again? It was It was a cat that uh, because someone couldn't get a, uh, a cat flap in their cottage, so they built like a cat ladder that goes out of their like their, so uh, when when we're not window. talking to you on this podcast, do you just watch cat videos? No. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they're dogs. Oh man. Oh my goodness. <laughs>